Um, so yeah, my name is Peter Schoenberg, and what I'm going to do today is, uh, I'm here tomorrow as well, which makes me feel like well, some cats kill comedians saying I'm here all weekend, but it's actually almost true. Um, today I'm going to focus primarily on the planning and, and getting it started, and tomorrow I'm going to sort of talk about after 12 months of running a makerspace, what have we learned. So that is kind of how the two sessions will, will be different. There will be overlap, but there will be a, quite a difference, that's my intention to make them. If you come to them both, I think you'll find value in both of them. Just want to say that first. So, I'm going to jump right in. Um, just a tiny bit of EDL. You probably know about us, but we are, we talk about being a community led organization, one library, one staff, one collection, 17 branches, two more in 2014, one of which opened yesterday, actually. Two uh, more. So, 18 branches as of now, and in another month, 19 branches. Two blending machines, they built gold, um, and that's our budget, that's our FTDs, that's how many Evertonians there are. And that's how many of how fast Edmonton is growing. I'm not sure if Regina is also growing fast. I suspect it is. I know Edmonton is a crazy growing population, a crazy growing city. Just so a tiny bit of context. I didn't include that. We did get to be library of the year, which was, and that's our mayor. That's Don Iverson, fantastic mayor, remarkable library supporter, and former member of the library board. We have a remarkable relationship with our with our city council, and the support of the city council is why we're able to do some things like we talk about that we're doing. Okay. So, in the beginning. It started with our business plan, that was our previous business plan, and that business plan created digital literacy as a core library service. We want to enthuse staff, and we want to be EPL as the community digital workspace. And one of the strategies that came out of that was, in 2013, create digital learning spaces within and beyond EPL's walls. And we succeeded in doing that one by opening a makerspace, and we opened our makerspace in October of 2013. So we are just a year and a bit live with a makerspace. We also launched uh, a digital a lit van, which is basically a mobile van packed with cool stuff, including makerspace type stuff that travels around with the unserved, underserved parts of our community. So that was the, the background driver. Specifically in the makerspace now, uh, Linda Cook, who's our CEO, and I don't know if you know, it's announced her retirement, which is very sad for the after 18 years. She's been a remarkable leader of the organization, and she had the original vision of this creative maker type space. She actually thought of the sound recording booth. I'll come to at the very end of today. And she asked me and Drew Melvis to create a report, Planning this Space for Customer Create. That was the title of the report that the man created. And that came out in December 2012. I got involved in January 2013. So at that point, people had decided we were going to make this thing called the Maker Space. We didn't really quite know what it was going to be yet. And so we started from knowing we were going to do this thing to getting it live in basically about 10 months. Basically. The key recommendation of that report I just want to touch on, we used our existing AD room, we were going to include a 3D printer, we would consider the espresso book machine, we would include gaming, we would include robotics, and we wanted to have some digital conversion areas within the space. And I'll talk about all those areas as we go forward. But those are some of the guiding recommendations um, of that initial report. I have to give huge credit to my digital literacy librarians. Uh, one of the areas I manage with the digital literacy librarians, Holly, who has had a huge role in the makerspace, the absolute core of the success of the makerspace, Carla Kim, who was replaced by Jason Parker through the project. So high energy, dedicated, smart, enthused, get it done, we had renovations. We also moved our own offices, which is a nightmare and took a long time. Because at EPL, every renovation we do takes at least 50% longer than you think it will, and I suspect you have the same experience in your home, in your library. It's always the same. And I also, in the middle of last year, uh, or year when we were planning this, got married and went on a honeymoon. So all of that happened, and we still managed to, to get this done. So, I want to talk about Edmonton a little bit in the context. Edmonton was ready for a maker space um, for a couple of reasons. We had a maker culture growing in the city of Edmonton. We had a group called Make Something Edmonton that kind of spontaneously arose and was looking to be a place where people could share making ideas and making. So we used the Make Something Edmonton site to ask people to help us name the Edmonton Public Library maker space. And that was a, an intriguing process. But we also had a group called Startup Edmonton which is a business incubator site affiliated with the Edmonton Economic Development Corporation. So there was, a, there was a community sense of making, there was some sort of institutions and organizations within the city thinking already about making it and sort of moving in that direction. So we didn't actually have people beating down our door saying, you can open a makerspace. Although we are very community driven, we actually didn't have members of the community saying, we want you to do this thing called a makerspace. Because a lot of people didn't know what a makerspace was when we opened it, and that was one of the risks and one of the challenges. But we, that the community in a broader level was ready for something like this without actually knowing it. Um, yeah. 
So this is this is us, and so one of the great challenges is what are we going to name our thing called the makerspace? We have all these crazy cute names, and they're going to be like the, 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 the creation zone, and, and at the end of the day, we finally said to on the site, said, why don't you just call it a makerspace? Which I love, because that's what I thought it should have been all along. <laughs> and I hate cutesy names for things. I just hate because they sound so dated and pathetic two years later. So we, we didn't go with the cutesy name, we called it the makerspace. But that was just an example of how the city was moving in a direction that we were trying to move in as well. So my goals in the project, when I took it over, these are the things that I was trying to do. One was create a bright, open, flexible space, and I'll talk about the physical space. Surprise our customers, and one of my favorite things in the library is to do something more, better, bigger than the customers would expect. Our customers did not expect to make space to open. Our customers did not expect to be able to do online courses through the EPL website. Our customers did not expect to be able to stream millions of songs live via the EPL. And those are all the kind of areas that I get to work in, and those are the kind of things where we surprise and exceed expectation that I love, and are the reasons that people still care about libraries as we go forward. We still have our core. We're not giving up our core, but it's this new excitement that gets a new audience, that gets a new generation, that gets people that don't cross our walls right now, our doors. There's a lot of people out there who think they know what the library is. But unfortunately, you know what they think it is. It's a place with books where people take their children. And the books are old, and they might not even be that clean necessarily. That's the kind of stuff we're always fighting. The reality is, we are so much more than that. You guys know that. But doing something like this, absolutely fundamentally changes your position in the community and your perceived in the community. It connects you to communities and groups that are absolutely separate from the communities and groups you think of you right now. So it's really it's surprising customers. I'm sorry, really in this case it's surprising non-customers. Really is what we're doing. It's much more like to surprise customers. Exceed customer expectations and that's, that goes with go big when we can. Spend on great stuff, not rentals. We really wanted to try to do this thing well. Uh, Linda Cook was very clear that she wanted us to do it, and Linda does not believe in half measures. She didn't want, and, and I gotta be really clear, EPL is very fortunate, we had fun to do this stuff. Libraries have done great things with these activities with a single computer, have done great things with a small room. You can do great things. Things I talked about today, you can take elements of that and have great success in the branch. You do not need to build a big shiny maker space in your downtown location. Having said that, that was our intention, to build something noteworthy and attractive and vis highly visible. So. Except the uncertainty. This is to me one of the absolute most important parts of the planning of makerspace. We honestly, from the beginning, had the idea that we were creating a platform. This is a platform in the sense of a programming platform or a creation or a making platform, and we didn't know what people would do with it. And that was okay. The idea is we're going to put all this cool stuff in a room, we're going to staff it with really smart people, and we're going to see what happens. We honestly didn't know what people would actually want to do, who would show up, what kind of programs would succeed, what software was the right software. We took some good guesses, and I'll talk about the research we did. But ultimately, we accepted the uncertainty. We went ahead and we created a great space and then said, okay, what are people going to do with this great space we have? Accepting that was really important. If we had tried to study this to death, medium to death, and nail what exactly what it was going to be, it wouldn't be open today. But it's been open for a year and it's been a great success. So I just think it's really important to accept that sometimes. Enjoy the project. This is the most fun thing I've ever got to do in my life. I started shelving books when I was 15. That's a long time ago. I've been working in libraries one way or the other for a long time. This is the most single fun thing I ever got to do in all that time. I love this project. Um, and I've done a lot of cool technology related stuff in my years. So it's, it's been great. But enjoy it. Oh, great. So create an open platform. See what our community does with it. That is really... You need to be trusting in your community and trusting that good things will arise and you don't know the answers. And they will sometimes tell you the answers, and that's good. The timeline. January, we had to, well, of course, even though I talked about not committing things to death, we had to have a committee, of course. We had to have a team, and the team had to have terms of reference. We had to select a team, and the team met and formed some teams. Okay, you know how that works. You've got to do that stuff. Morgan was a summer student. She did a survey of every makerspace she could find in North America. She emailed them, phoned them, whatever she could do. And we tried to follow what every other makerspace in North America was doing. It was not that long a list. They were mainly in the States. And in the States, the American government had a really nice chunk of funding for reaching out to at-risk teens. So what you'll find, generally speaking, not absolutely, but generally in America, the makerspace have a very strong teen at-risk youth emphasis. We very consciously said, well, that's great. We are, we are going for everybody. We are not, we're not picking one age group. We are saying, this is broad. We are not trying to target youth, although, in fact, most of the things we do are very popular with kids and teens, very popular. But it wasn't like we made it just for them. 
and some American libraries because of funding have taken that route. So we also learned about technologies that worked and um, 3D printing technologies and what people were using and all that kind of stuff. And we'll talk about how we got there. We had to, we had to. Um, I'll show you the pictures in a minute. We took our EV room, and if you think of our DVD and our CD collection, all, every all of that, which is probably the most used, active, growing part of our entire collection, in a world where physical circulation is, has peaked or is decreasing. I don't know about you guys, but for us, I believe the tipping point was two years ago. The E stuff goes to the roof. The physical stuff is, is plateauing or is starting to start that gradual decline. In a world where the physical circulation is fading, we took our most popular books, uh, sorry, CDs and movies and video games, and moved them from the front area and put them up on the second floor because it was so important to get a great visible space in the maker space. So when I say MPL EPL committed to this, we really committed. We decided this was important. We would sacrifice highly prized collection resource area and make this an active learning space. So that was a very conscious choice we made. To do that, we had to throw over every government doc we have. We have been collecting government docs from the depository for physical, for federal, provincial, and city government docs for a history of EPL. We threw virtually every last one of them out. We don't do that anymore. It's online. Why are we wasting our time on the U of A visit anyway? But that's what it's simplistic second explanation. But this is recorded. I told totally you it's recorded. I'm going to be in trouble now. <laughs> the reality is we had to get rid of this stuff. So we've got rid of a huge, like, an area of shelving as big as your whole library probably because our gut docs collection gone. We took our babies collection, put it upstairs, which created a major space room. We had a design shred. May have to be, I don't know what M stands for, but it's Art and Design at Edmonton. It's a group of young architects, landscape designers, and just cool interesting people who approached us. They heard about the project to make something at Edmonton. We'd like to do a design shred with you. I didn't even know what a design shred was. It's actually a remarkably useful process where we basically got together in, in groups with them facilitating and said, okay, what are the things that are going to be in the space? What are the traffic flows? What are the activities? What's your physical space? And we had pieces of paper, we were drawing, we were modeling. At the end of the day, we fundamentally changed the arrangement of the room the way we thought it should be. We thought we had this great idea where the, the gaming would be here, this would be there. It's like, no, actually, that makes no sense. And so this is a group of citizens who were engaged in the make project and engaged with the concept of it and helped us make it better. So that was, there's a lot of community engagement like that. By July, we had space ready for contractors. And then, then it got ugly after that, pretty much. Uh, you said AV. Remote AV. What does the stand for? Oh, AV, sorry, audiovisual. The CDs and the DVDs I was talking about. Oh. Sorry, a bit of jargon there, yeah. So, we also had a lot of fun. Starting in June through September, we started buying and wearing tons of fun stuff. So, 3D printers, espresso book machines, robots, kits, furniture, chairs, uh, speakers, projectors, all that kind of stuff. We had a ton of fun. We spent a lot of money and had a lot of fun doing that. The seriously biggest piece was the espresso book machine, and I'll come to that. It is more expensive than the whole rest of the place put together, and for the vast majority of libraries, that's not something you're probably going to get. It's a hundred thousand dollars all by itself. That's a lot of money. Like that's, and it's a lot. And I'll talk. It's it's great, but there's some challenges. And, and if you come tomorrow, I'll talk more about some of the challenges. But it's it's great. July through October, electrical work and painting, which should have been done in two months, was as you see, many more than two months. We actually hired our makerspace assistants in September, and I'll talk about them. In October seventh, was supposed to be the handover of the space, not quite. Three weeks later, we actually got the space, which is like a month later than it's supposed to be when we first started. But anyway, that's the process we went through. The main space systems, I'll talk about them just a bit later, because they're critical to this. So that was our AD room. So a busy room with lots of CDs, lots of DVDs, and video games, because we have a lot of video game loaning going on, too. Before, oops, I'm going to die. OK, don't die. OK. Before again, so you see that's the entryway. I don't know if you know our library, but the Milner Library is the downtown library, so we have the downtown community. We have some very challenging and challenged customers, people whose lives are very bad and come into us because otherwise they freeze to death in the streets. So we have a very interesting community. We also have the downtown artistic community there. We also have the downtown business community there. So we have a remarkably diverse community in Milner. You come in the front entrance, we have a sort of circulation service area here, and just off the right, that's the entrance way into what is now the maker space. Highly visible, great location. Couldn't have got a better location. Like, it's fantastic, the location. Which is also challenging when everybody walks in off the street and is perhaps not right there, comes into our space, and we have to deal with it too. But, doing that. but the point of the so we started to work, we are making a maker space. That was the, that was the first people started to worry about it. We had that little sign. Okay, come on. Really? Ah. There we go. 
So we've got it. And, and I think on my earlier slide, I said I didn't want to spend money on renos and stuff if I could avoid it. So all we did with this, we took out the ceiling, which was hideous. Actually, it's not that dissimilar to this. <laughs> <laughs> it's not weird. It's, 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 it's a dated, brownish, dirty-ish, fluorescent-ish ceiling. We ripped that out and painted the exposed stuff black because it gave us a completely different look and feel and painted the walls white. That's pretty much what we did. We did not want to spend money on that stuff if we could avoid it. And so we did painting the ceiling, painting the black turn would be remarkably expensive because they had to shoot and paint every pipe and every exposed bit of everything up there. It took weeks actually. Couldn't believe that. Uh, we, got in, we, we did buy a, a, a door, so we actually enclosed it a little bit, partly for noise in and partly just to, sense, to create a sense of this is a space. So we did get that, that, that glass wall put in there. That was getting very close. Now you're getting, okay, that's now a sense of the maker space. Looking, remember the AV room now? So really all we did was paint. Uh, and there's a couple of important things going on here. You see how lovely and dark the ceiling is. You see there the power in the ceiling, I'll talk about it in a second. There's a book machine there, green screen projector. That became the gaming area. And actually that's where our new sound booth has just been put in the wall that should open next week. We'll talk about the gist of the area, but that's, that's coming later. And staff desk, etc. So a very different look uh, than we had originally. So. What was actually in the space when we opened? I want to work through some of the key facilities and services and some of the, why we chose what we chose. Oh, that's what it looks like visually. So we have a remarkable group uh, in our branding area. So that's just fine. That's just vinyl. I mean, it's not cheap. It's also not very expensive. And it looks really sharp. You, you took the crappy beige wall and you put that great vinyl on it, put vinyl on the glass, and you have a visual identity that's really, really strong. And it was really beautifully done because again, if the walls are white, the columns interior are, are black, and the green screen is green. So they took the green and the black and made that the visual identity. So all of our handouts, all of everything we do has that simple visual identity, green, black. Very simple, very strong. But it's part of what makes this a highly visible location. Okay. 3D printers from Machina. Kyle's sitting in the back row. <laughs> uh, we, we started with two 3D printers. The one on the left is the larger X24. The one on the right is the X16. Uh, as of about a month and a half ago, we have three of these printers now. And the reason we have three printers is uh, base and demand. We, we were finding we got up to a 10 week backlog of print jobs, which is a lot of backlog. Um, a lot of backlog. So, with three of them, we, and we've had all three operating beautifully and smoothly. With two, we occasionally had one, one would be, there'd be a little tweak here, a little there, a little repair, a little adjustment. It took us a while to get good at operating these machines. Kyle can speak as a bit of it, I could probably. But we have our four makerspace assistants, they're, they were hired to work in the makerspace. That's all they do, one full-time and three part-time. That's our sum total of dedicated staffing. And we're open Monday to Friday, 9 to 9, uh, Saturday, 10 to 6, and Sunday, 1 to 5. So if you think of one full-time and three part-time, that's thin. Very, very, very thin. But we managed to do that with pulling some other people in. They, they have the skill set to do these. We don't just let anybody touch the 3D printers. Obviously, the customers do the modeling, but we're actually directly interacting with the machines because 3D printing technology right now is not at the point where we can just let customers get in and get hands on with it yet. The day will come, and if somebody has them in their basement and they're dedicated, they're going to be great at it. But in our situation, our staff are actually the ones at the end who need to submit to the job of managing that process. And we learned some very simple things like don't turn the machine on and let it heat up and then get distracted because somebody wanted to, wanted to book in or had another question. And you've got the machine heating up and you don't submit a print job. The nozzle gets hot and it's too hot and the filament hits it and you burn the filament in the nozzle and you've got a problem. Little things like that, you just have to consciously work with these things. So our maintenance based systems, when they work with these, it's very clear. If you're doing 3D printing, for the first five minutes, that's what you're doing. You submit the job, you make sure it starts, and once it's started and it's got a base row, you can walk away and serve customers for the next seven hours while it prints this object out. Because it can take seven hours to print an object. It can take objects take a while, without a doubt. And that's that's one of the challenges of, of working with 3D printing. That's uh, Kyle's got some great samples at his table, but that's uh, one of my favorite visual ones. Okay. Espresso book machine. This was another car. Linda really wanted to see an espresso book machine, and we were fortunate in a certain sense. One, they had the funding to do this, and two, the U of A had one, they had the first models, and they had decided to get rid of theirs, but we didn't know it. So basically, we were just opening when the U of A sent an email out to all of their existing users and customers saying, we're, we're decommissioning our espresso book machine, but guess what? EPL's got one. So that was good. I uh, mean, all of a sudden, all these people in 
academic community knew about our expressive book machine, but it was bad in the sense that the U of A offered a level of service we don't. So we are not currently offering editing services. You bring us two files, and basically bring us a PDF for the cover, a PDF for the contents, we submit the jobs, 10 minutes later, the book is done. It's that simple. The book can be 50 pages, the book can be 800 pages. That's all it takes. But if your writing sucks, if you have typos, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what we do in the makerspace. We actually have a writer in residence at EBL who you could maybe arrange something with, but we don't do that. We make sure that the page is laid out, that it's not going to bleed off the cover, but after that, it's yours. So the U of A had a different level of service. We had to push back a little on that and, and work that out. This has been great for us, so we are doing hundreds of copies of books every single month. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually beautifully, it's busy enough that it's really worthwhile, but it's not so busy that it has like an eight to 10 week backlog that we've got to do 3D printing. It's just nice and steady and moves along. Again, you've got to manage it carefully. We actually, in the end, hired somebody to come in once a week for one hour, and once a month for two hours to do the basic prepping, oiling, et cetera, of the machine. What happened was our makerspace assistants are too busy being makerspace assistants to do machine maintenance. And we were realizing the machine was not as well maintained as we needed to be. We, we put in a schedule, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning to do this. Well, at 9 o'clock in the morning, there's seven guys walking into one of gaming, somebody else on this machine, somebody else doing this, and this going on, and they're trying to freeze printing. It just wasn't doable, so we actually had to put that cost out there. And there's already uh, maintenance cost for this. There's a, there's a maintenance contract for this, plus Ooh, a month ago, we had a bearing fail, which apparently only happens in four of a thousand machines. We had one of those four. We had to fly the tech up from the States. We spent two days working on the machine. We paid for this hotel and had to fly it home again. So this is not a machine you get into casually or trivially. Or, and you need to think about this. It is a fantastic service. People love it. We use school groups come in. It's great, but you need to very consciously think about what you're committing to something like this. 3D printing, cost is... It was trivial, but in comparison, it's a couple of thousand dollars, and, the, and the, it's, it's nothing in comparison. This is a serious decision to make. I think it's great, but I would not recommend this casually in any way, shape, or form. Um, that's, that's what I would say about the terms of the Robots and kits. The top right part of that was just a typical day, and that when all of the new, every day new boxes would arrive with fun stuff. We were just enjoying unpacking there. Um, and these are just examples of some of the kits we have. So we've got a Raspberry Pi on the left, the Makey Makey kits on the right. Uh, I don't know if they've got a Lego robot in there. No, okay. We also have the Lego robots, which have been a great success for us, and, and I'll talk in detail about programs tomorrow, the programming we're doing with some of those things. But great success with these small little devices. And these are the kinds of things that we're putting into our branches. And so brand, we're starting to build programming that we, that we test and use the makerspace as a lab, basically. We try stuff out, we try cool stuff. If it works, we then develop it and then get a branch to try it, perhaps. And if it works, then we try to roll it out to more branches. But these are small, simple kits. And these really get at people interacting with technology, whether they're coding, whether they're um, using the Lego robotics. And the Lego robotics are great. I don't know if you, do you guys know what Lego robotics are? Mm -hmm. Mainly, yes. Basically, it's, it's, it's really it's Lego with robots, right? It's that simple. But at the heart of it is a little brick, and the brick is programmable. And so the kids, we have, a, we have a Lego Robotics Club that goes, runs every Saturday at 1.30. Consistently great attendance. Lovely with dads and dads and daughters and dads and sons. We get the dads in, and as you know, someone's getting the dads in always, isn't always the easiest in the library. We get dads loving Lego Robotics. The kids are coming in and assembling, but they're actually using the sensors in the robots to do things like sensing light or sensing motion or following patterns or tracing. And in doing that, they're programming. They're basically saying, if the sensor does this, then that, or else which is the fundamental loop and, and logic of programming. The kids have no idea that they're learning programming. They're having an incredible time playing with Lego or robots, but they're actually learning the principles of programming. And the cool thing about some of these small kits is people are learning it, and the kids, we have school groups come in all the time, lots and lots of school groups. They love this stuff. They don't realize they're learning necessarily. They're just having fun. And it, it's a, they've been a great and consistent success for us using, using the kits without the depth. Gaming, that's Holly. Um, we opened with three, three um, console games set up because EBL has a large video gaming collection and we made a, after considerable debate, the single biggest point of debate in our Makerspace Committee team meeting was whether gaming fit within the Makerspace. Because there's a tension there, because the, the gaming is ultimately just a play and it's not exactly a trade. And we were not quite sure how we were gonna balance those things. And in fact, 
in the early days, the balance was problematic for us. We had a lot of very enthused gamers who were so enthused that they would be hugely disruptive. And we developed a community of gamers, which was great. But within that community, we had some serious challenges with people downtown and some people who police later told us were drug dealers and some really interesting stuff going on around gaming. So gaming was a challenge and a serious conversation. I'll show you in a minute how we solve some of those challenges within the space. But we do have, we have the Xbox, the PS3, and as I noted, 60-inch LCDs. So again, when I say we're not going to have acid, it's not a cheap little TV in the wall. It's a great, gorgeous, beautiful LCD. You walk in and you see it and you think, wow, I want to sit and play there. Not like other libraries trying to gain it. They don't really get it. They're old. It's kind of crap. We didn't want to do that. We wanted people to walk in and go, wow, that's cool. I want to do that. And so if we're going to do the gaming, we're trying to really do it. I mean, yes, it costs more, but it's totally worth it. We also bought uh, two gaming PCs. So console gaming, and again, that's actually a picture of the PC we bought. And it is a gaming PC. It's not a typical library computer. Our typical library computers are very generic boxes, moderately powered, can run browsers in office and do a few basic things, are locked down, you can't really do much of anything. They're not like a real computer at home, you can't install anything. They're, they're, a, they're a library appliance. These are not like that. These are seriously loaded graphic cards, high-powered gaming machines, so people come in and have a gaming experience. I also wanted the gamer to walk in and look over and see it and say, that's a gaming machine. Without us even having to put a sign on the wall that says gaming machine, you look at that thing, if you're a gamer, you know that's a gaming machine. And it's got to deliver a gaming experience if we're going to do it. So we, we have two of those, and they were probably three times the cost of our normal little cheap boxes, which are like the normal generic Lenovo boxes. This is like a non-generic Lenovo box. And we install Steam, which is a, a way to download games, and we have a lot, of, a lot of good success with that. We have a digital conversion station. So part of you'll notice that a lot of what we do is digital. EPL made a conscious choice that we were doing a digital a digital emphasis in our makerspace. So we don't have vinyl cutting, we don't have laser cutters, we don't have sewing machines, we don't have cooking, and all those things are completely valid creative activities. We chose, because of the emphasis on digital literacy in our business plan, that the digital was the emphasis. You could make complete different choices. You make a different choice in every branch. We make that choice in this location. This is, again, not the only way. This is how we did it. I want to be really clear. There are so many different ways to do something like this. You're not saying, do it this way. I'm not saying this is how you should do it, I'm saying this is how we did it, and I think you can learn from some of this, but there are so many different paths to go. So we have a scanner, obviously, VHS to DVD machine, various inputs and outputs for sound and digital. And we, this was actually problematic initially because the scanner was the only scanner in the building when we first opened. <laughs> we didn't so we had this constant lineup of people wanting to scan and email stuff, because the scanner on the second floor, actually there was one, but it didn't scan an email, and it was a crappy scanner, and no one understood how to use it. So we kind of had to struggle with that a little bit. But it leads to great stories, and, and I'm not going to get too into the great service stories, but I'll tell you one around the scanner, which is one of my favorite stories in the space. We had a, a grandfather walk in with a stack of drawings that his grandson had done. And he just walked in and said, do you have a scanner? I'd like to scan these drawings my grandson did. Great. Straightforward doing it. Well, my maker's businesses are so good. They said, well, you know what? If you do that, we can take you over to this creative computer. We can edit these and lay them out for you. If you really want, we can do a little more work, and we can print them in a book. So our grandfather walks into the makerspace with a stack of paper of drawings, walks out at the end of the day with a printed book of his grandson's drawings, and takes it home and says, I made a book of your drawings. Now that's a transformative experience, and that is not a typical library experience in a certain way. That is the kind of thing that couldn't have happened anywhere else. Because the library is a welcoming place where that grandfather felt safe. We have something in Edmonton called Ants, Edmonton New Technology Society. There are a bunch of hardcore geeks of a bunch of high and weird technology in a kind of a funny room, and they're intimidating as hell, and the grandfather would never have walked in there to ask for help for anything like this to do with technology. The library is an open, known, safe, public space that people come to anyway. So they'll come to you anyway, and they can be connected to the other things, or they come to you for this. It works both ways. Your existing customers can be pulled into this incredible creative making opportunity, and creative making people can be pulled into the library. It works in both directions for us. It's not like it just works in one way or the other way. So I just love that scanning story. And we get the VHS to DVD machine, great idea. But it turns out, of course, which I didn't really think about, you're not copying a VHS to DVD. Like when you think of copying a computer file, you're playing the VHS while you play it, it's being recorded. So if somebody brings in a six hour VHS, your machine is tied up for six hours, right? Didn't quite think about that. So anyway, we, we go. <laughs> but it's just one of those little things that you, you know, in your mind, you copy a file. Well, no, you're not actually copying a file, you're recording while playing. 
slightly different story. Yeah. What time was it? VHS basketball? Oh, VHS is the old style video cassette. Oh. Okay. So you take your old video cassette, and the reason, and actually, just the, the reason for all of these things is that you bring in traditional analog, non digital, non editable stuff. So you bring in, a, a, like, you know, your wedding video from who knows when, or whatever it might be, you, and you turn it into something digital, which you can then edit, mash out, upload, download, do something with. Same thing with the, the grandfather, he had his, the drawings on paper, but we can upload them, we can edit them, you can put them in the book, you could do who knows what with them. So we're trying to take traditional analog material and turn it into something digital with the cool stuff in the space and then edit, work with, improve, modify, do those things for it. Yeah. Alright. Okay, loaded media computers. So we have four IMAX, which are those beautiful all-in-one machines, nice big screens, and four loaded DELs, because we wanted to well, first, we knew we were going to get IMAX, and that was interesting because there were no Max and BPL except in the back room for our designer guys. So right away, our IT group had to accept that Max were coming into the space. The solution to act, that action for our IT group is to have a, a local Mac shop support those machines. Because our, our, our IT group, even though they're great, don't have the capacity to support Max right now. So that's what we had to do. But we needed Max. You can't have, in my opinion, you cannot have to create a space like this without having Max. If you say we're a, we're a PC shop and you're going to do PCs, I feel like you're just you're saying to people, I'm not hearing you. I don't understand what you're doing. You're going to do it my way, and that doesn't work. If this is how people work. This is the kind of tool people expect. So that's what we did. And then we wanted a nice Dell all in one. So the all you could have like a glorious, lovely looking iMac and then a crappy PC box. So you get a similar ish Dell box, equally loaded, all in one screen kind of thing. And on it, we have things like Adobe Creative Suite, which just about killed me. The stupid, most expensive piece of software ever. Unbelievably expensive, like two grand a computer, times eight. Sixteen thousand dollars to put that bloody software on those machines. It's ridiculous. But Adobe owns that market. It is the tool that people expect. I hated it. I still hate it. And we have no choice. <laughs> that, you know. Uh, so then we also have sound editing, video editing, garage, like things like GarageBand, animation software, game creation software, and a bunch of other specialized stuff from making music, making videos, doing all those kind of things. So there's a bunch of stuff on here. Some of which is open source whenever we could. Uh, some of which is the standard tools. We try generally not to buy like the industrial production level tool. Adobe was kind of the exception. So for like the music making software, we had GarageBand, great free entry level. We have Free Loops, which is another looping software. We have Ableton, which is another one which are kind of great mid-range, and if you can use those, you can do almost professional production, but we're not trying to buy professional. We, in, in the context of Edmonton, the maker is a place for people starting out, newly creating, newly making, starting a business, being an entrepreneur, starting an agent, just wanting to do something that they don't have at home and they want to get started. They want to try, they want to make, they want to create. We are not the place where you want to go into business and say, I'm going to make my album that's going to sell 2 million copies. We are not going to print 200 copies of your book on our Expressive Book Machine. In fact, if you're asking for more than 50, we're going to suggest you go to a commercial printer, because they'll be faster and maybe even cheaper, about 70 or more we know they're cheaper. And again, if you want to do 3D printing, you say, I want 500 of these things for my corporate event. We're going to say, talk to Kyle Machina. We don't do 500, that's not us. We are not production commercial, we are entry creative citizen starting entrepreneur, that's what we're about, that's what we need to be. To move into that other area, that's not us. And no one else does that. Right? There are lots of commercial people who will take your money. We don't take your money for anything, practically. Hardly anything. There's an iMac, there's a bunch of some kids at a, a visit with the Makey Makey's. We have, you can do with the Makey Makey's, you make a banana piano where you put them all up and you lift a banana, it interacts with the computer and it plays a note. Which in one way is really simplistic and silly and fun, but in the other way you're actually teaching the kids that this computer is not just a toaster, which is how a lot of kids think of technology. You turn it on, it works. It's actually something you can plug other things into. You can interact with it. You can control it. We, I think we honestly have a generation of kids, generally speaking, who, see, who love technology, use technology, we give them a lot of credit. And I believe much of that credit is misplaced. I think they think of them as toasters, and they now read the screen. And I'm not sure they understand. This is like my father's generation time with cars. I have no idea about cars. I turn the key and it works. And I, that's how kids are with computers. They turn the key and it works, which is okay and it's great, but it doesn't mean they understand it. It doesn't mean they think about how they can interact with it, how they can change it, how they can modify it, how they can build their own, how they can tear it apart and salvage bits from it, how they can reuse it, how they can fix it. What a concept. My God, we can fix something. It, we need, it's part of that is making people think differently about the technology. And that's, this is, okay. Okay, we have a projector, we have a retractable screen, we have speakers, and we have a green screen. So, 
Yeah, we, we wanted to make it really easy to do a presentation that I'll talk tomorrow about a whole bunch of different kind of presentations and programs and stuff that come into the space. But we have those things. The green screen is the simplest thing in the world. You could do that here. You could paint this wall green, and you've got a green screen for local people to shoot against. How, it's the simplest, easiest oh. thing ever. I painted the wall green partly because I thought, what the hell, we'll do it. It sends a visual message. People walk by and go, hey, that's a green screen. Yeah, it's a wall painted green. Like, it's zero technology. <laughs> it's a paint. And yet, it sends a message, and it works, and people use it. And we do cool things with school groups. But if we put the kids in front of them, take a picture, and Photoshop in the background like a dinosaur eating our head. What? So the kids have suddenly seen a photo, seen the ability to edit a photo, seen the ability to manipulate. Suddenly they think, but how can you manipulate media? The photo I see is not necessarily the photo that was taken. There's real learning and literacy in that. And they have no idea. They're just seeing things differently. And that's a great way to do that kind of stuff. Okay. There it was. Okay, really exciting. A really bad picture, I might say. But anyway. Maybe two assistants, I touched on them before. One 35-hour week was actually an existing EPL employee. We were very lucky, and these are library assistant level positions, which is not our librarian position. We have library assistants which are like our, they're library techs, so they have a library tech diploma or a university degree, but not a library, they're not librarians. So we have lots and lots of, these are the same people in the rest of our organization who be doing customer service and programming type work, but in our case, they're makerspace assistants and a very special service. So the full-time person was actually, a, 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 as I said, in LA, which is great, he knew the whole library story, and is just a hardcore tinker geek kind of guy. He just loves playing with stuff. He showed up at the interview with like, you know, like an Arduino that he welded into like a cookie tin to make like pheromone sounds. That's what he showed up at the interview for. So like right away you knew this was the guy that was going to fit in, and he's great. And he's also a teacher. We actually are hiring a lot of teachers, and I found that teachers are remarkably good as library systems. They, they know how to interact, they know how to teach, they know how to program. That's huge for us now. That's huge for the kind of work that we do. The other ones that are actually, we had like somebody who's working on their master's and now PhD in some kind of educational technology area. We had somebody else who was working in the U of A museums. And the other person was actually a former teacher who had a great personal interest in technology and creation and has become our best 3D printing person. So the other three knew nothing about libraries. And we had to really train them up on the library side of things. But they brought a lot of technology skills. So different types of positions, different types of people hired. Just barely enough to, to open the hours again. And we, we've had to pull some other hours in considerably more. So in January 2014, we got 35 hours a week from the rest of the downtown library. They basically gave up 35 hours and gave them to us, which is very nice of them. And they give it to us in five different people doing one shift each a week. And for a while, we get 10 different people. And we'll talk about that challenge of training tomorrow when we get there. We also have our lip bands who give us eight hours a week. So that helps too, because otherwise, we don't have enough bodies. We really want two people in the space at all times. And sometimes you barely have that. And there's a lot going on in this space. Coming, sound recording area is still in planning stages. Well, actually, no, one of the slides, oops, okay, the sound recording area is actually virtually done. So we did, but we did order electronic keyboard, beatbox, and music editing software, and headphones, and those have been getting really steady use from the very beginning. We used sound design consultants to make a sound recording area, and they actually recommended buying pre assembled. Uh, sound booths from a company called Whispered in California. So you basically just put together two sound booths. So when I get back, I hope on Monday we should have two sound booths, one of which is about 10 by 15 and one of which is about 5 by 10. So you've got quiet places. People like making music, but obviously we had one guy who wanted to sing in the space. And while the singing actually wasn't good, it, even if it was good, <laughs> it's highly disruptive to somebody singing in a space where somebody else is trying to do something over here. It just didn't work, so we're really looking forward to that. You know, my office right now is an electronic. There's an electric, electric guitar, a bass, uh, an acoustic guitar, an amp, and headphones, and, and guitar straps. Because we're waiting to get them out of my office down into the space. So that's coming very, very soon for us. That was the piece that we didn't get done in the first go around. Okay, I'm doing all right. Because I'm really... I'm getting a plus okay, I want to turn the question. Challenges. There was a lot of challenges in this project. Um, one was new learning. We had never done any of this before. I didn't know what some of the things I ordered even were when we ordered them. We had never had library staff work with these technologies before, so the, the robots, the kits, 3D printing, expressive book machines, all of it was absolutely brand new, so that was hard, but exciting and fun, um, but hard. Um, painting, electrical, painting electrical just proved to be a huge pain in the butt. Um, as I already talked about when I was furniture, one of the things I've learned is I haven't done a lot of furniture ordering before. Is you must order furniture at least two months before you think you must order furniture two months before. I'm not kidding. Furniture <laughs> takes forever to get anywhere and just about killed us uh, when we, we didn't have appropriate furniture to start with. Some of the other challenges we had were the fact that we are in such a great public visible space. Everybody walked in the library and went, oh my god, look at those gorgeous computers. I'm going to sit down and use those computers. 
where I said they're not typical computers. Every other computer in the library is locked down, can't do much with, has a one hour time limit, requires a library card, and then the hour you're done, that's it. We made a very conscious choice when we talked about flexible. Um, and I, I didn't touch the chocolate even more. The choice to make it flexible meant a lot of things. It meant all of the chairs are on wheels, all of the tables are on wheels, there are no pillars. I mentioned just briefly, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a sec, the way we did power. All of the computers are on Wi Fi, there's no network cables. So in the afternoon, if we got a school group coming, we can rearrange everything completely, and it all still works. And in the morning, we have a speaker, we arrange it a different way, and it works. There is nothing that stops us from moving anything around, and that was absolutely critical to what we were doing. Um, we also, question. Yeah. Is it pre necessary or not? Uh, just because it was an ugly old room, we just wanted it to look different and nice. That was all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, necessary, no, but I would say yes for, for it to look the way we wanted it to. Um, the other thing is the computers, so as I said, the other computers in the library are limited, dumb boxes with a one hour time limit. The computers in the mega space have no time limit, no library card requirement. You can install software, you can work all day in the same computer. So people who are frustrated because they can't get enough Facebook time in the main part of the library discovered, my God, look at these computers. So we spent, and still do unfortunately, spend in the, in the first month a lot of time talking to people about how this is not a place for Facebook. And that was really hard for us because we didn't, that's not what we envisioned doing. We didn't want to spend a lot of time telling people what they couldn't do. We had some great successes. Our makerspace assistants are amazing at talking to some of these young kids saying, well, you know, you can't do Facebook here. And we, have, we don't say it like that. We say, if you like to use Facebook, there's 50 other computers in this building you can do Facebook on. We can sign up one for you right now if you'd like. However, would you like to do some cool 3D modeling? Would you like to do this, 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 and this? So it's an opportunity sometimes, but it's a real challenge. And there were times, several times in those first months, where we seriously talked about whether we get IT to block Facebook. It got, and which is so against the library idea of blocking anything. And people legitimately were uploading products to Facebook occasionally. Or grabbing stuff from Facebook they wanted to bring down and edit. So there are there are rare but about the real reasons to use Facebook. And that was such a pushback for us. But it was a conscious choice, and every time I got pushed to the edge of doing that, I was like, no, step back. We want it open, we want it flexible, we don't want to create barriers, we don't want to create a bunch of rules. And there are very few rules. Basically, he says if you're using the space appropriately, you can be there all day. You can get seven hours of computer time in the makerspace. In the rest of the world, you can get one, maybe two, if you're lucky, and you can get an extension. It's different. Behavior rules are different. We don't allow food in the makerspace. We allow food in the rest of the building. We don't let you sleep in the makerspace. We let you sleep in the rest of the building. We actually discourage you from just kind of hanging out. Because what happened, again, was the teens discovered, what a cool place. My friend's playing video games over there. I'm going to have lunch over here. Well, then, oh my god, like the table and the crap and the noise. And, and so those kind of pushbacks. There's a lot of negotiation that was quite challenging in terms of behaviors because we were saying, because we weren't saying what we were, we were keeping as open as we could, we had to negotiate a lot of behaviors. Um, and how you set it up, how you do it when you pack up. But it was really, it was really important to us that we sort of fought through that, that desire to create a rule, to say no, to stop. And we, we fought through that and managed to keep it as open as we did. So we still have that Facebook conversation probably every day. Once or twice, probably every single day, somebody comes in and says, "Hey, do you know what Facebook in the space?" No. Well, actually, you know, this is not this is for. This is a cool thing to do. Blah blah. blah. Conversation happens. It still happens every single day. It probably happened in the last forty minutes. I would guarantee it. Back into the back and the So that was a challenge. And the one thing I'd say about the, the computer technology that I meant to mention is we have deep freeze in those computers. I don't know how many of you know what deep freeze is. Deep freeze, which we don't have in a regular use, absolutely is core to the success of these computers. Because deep freeze means. When somebody reboots the computer, everything AV's done to it is reset back to a state. Everything that was installed. Which means people can actually download and install and use it like a real computer. That's really important that people can use computers like real computers. The rest of the library, we can't offer that yet. We're looking at whether we can do that, but right now we can't. So deep freeze, we knew it would be a good idea because we didn't want to have all that kind of problems with bookings and the booking system. We didn't quite realize until we looked back retrospectively how that transformed the ability to use those computers and how important that openness was. So deep freeze really was really, really important. More so than I realized at the time. So one of those things you realize, in retrospect, it's a way better decision than I realized it was when I made it. Um, it's just one of those things, yeah. Okay. Opportunities, okay. Community interest, lots and lots of potential partners. So we had people, we had people approaching us constantly saying, can we bring a school group in? Can we bring a tour group in? Could I teach something in the space? Kyle's will be having a machine, will be teaching a 3D 
modeling in the space. We've got Guru Digital College, it's a local tech college, we'll be teaching in January a seven week how to create a video program in the maker space. We have people coming to us who want to teach, so the media we got in this was amazing. We've never, well, the winning live video was ridiculous. Okay, other than that, just truly a one in a hundred year anomaly. We got crazy media for this, and it was fascinating. I did, we were on TV, on all the channels, we were on radio, we were on all the newspapers, social media like crazy. Lots and lots of that. And that was fantastic, but interestingly enough, I will still talk to people, somebody at the university who I think is a smart connected person will go, I didn't know that maker space. Which is a really good reminder, despite getting more free media than I've ever seen for anything we've done, except for the <laughs> People still don't know about it. You've got to hammer and hammer and hammer, and I think part of it is because it's not their expectation of us. They don't go, well, of course, I've got a maker space. They go, wow, you've got a maker space? That is so cool. And again, one of my favorite things in the world is somebody goes, oh my god, that's so cool. You know, when we were rolling out old school databases, you didn't hear a lot of, oh my god, that's so cool. <laughs> and I say, they're useful, but they're boring. Uh, this, this stuff is really cool. Enthusiasts love to share. So we had really great luck. Um, there's a, a young woman who visited space a lot. I haven't seen her recently as much. She was really into 3D scanning. So she was teaching people about 3D scanning, taking the Kinect off her Xbox and scanning people, and then showing them how to edit the scan and create models from that. She just came in and did that as work with other people. So it was a great, great, great opportunity for community to arise in your space. And it's not your normal, not a community around a book club, it's a community around a technology, or a community around an interest, or a community around something different. The gaming community is, is, has loved, it, loved our space, for sure. Introducing the technology, I mentioned the Macs. I sort of alluded to this before. We test programs and services in the maker space and roll them out to branches. So ours is not a downtown only project, and that's something we really had to kind of push on because people thought, it's just there, and yes, we're not going to build a maker space in all of our locations as a kid, we cannot afford to, but what we are going to do, and we actually have done a few, and I'll talk about that more tomorrow, is roll, how we roll things out the branches. There will be elements of maker space, but we'll be making services in all the branches soon, and in programs, and it's just becoming now, we're getting people who are doing kids' programs saying, gee, I wonder if I could use Makey Makey's in my sing sign laugh and learn. Or maybe Baby Laugh, or maybe not Baby Laugh, that was my good example. <laughs> Uh, but it, so, like, we're, we've got to the point now where suddenly the people doing the kids' program and youth program are thinking, these are tools that would fit into my program, which is really what we want. We don't really want this is a technology program. We want this is programming that maybe includes technology. It's just part of what we do. Digital literacy is just part. It's, in many ways, it feels like digital literacy is core. <coughs> we also bring branch staff into the space. I've had more requests for job shadows and job visits. And, I mean, obviously, my, my, my record group is boring. We sit in our office and we're looking at computers. We're really a boring job shadow. Everybody wants a job shadow in the makerspace. It's a great, cool, interesting space to be in. Um, the makerspace makes great stories. I told this story of the dad and, and his um, grandson in the books, and I'll tell more stories tomorrow. Because there are incredible, great human stories that arise out of having this unique and creative space that cannot happen any other way. One or two more. Oh, but like, this is from City Hall School. We are very lucky. The City Hall School is right across the street from us in the library. The, the lady there actually knew from my own neighborhood. She brings the kids in. So this is just, they do these reflection things, and I just enjoy them. I used to think a lot of these things, like 3D printers, were impossible. And what if I learned so much of what technology can do, such as a 3D printer. I didn't know what a 3D printer does before I saw the makerspace. I liked it because my favorite part of the day was the makerspace and the EPL. Kids love this thing, and it's really funny. Linda, who's the teacher there, dance. Do you guys want to come back this way? They're like, yeah! And I ask you, how consistently we get that with some of our other school visits? I'm not saying we don't get enthusiasm, but this is different. There's something different here that we can capture that truly is different. Uh, this will be worse than that slide. No, okay. <laughs> I don't really have any slides. I hate having any slides. That's why that threw me out. These are two really small things that I just alluded to. The thing I write is our power. It's, you know, the basic pull-down power cord. Rather than having network in the outlets in the floor, which is a huge pain in the butt, we basically have a dozen of those hanging from the ceiling, spread out through the whole space. So wherever you go, you pull a table, you got your Wi-Fi computers connected, just pull down the power, connect, and go. It's that simple. And it fundamentally transforms the flexibility of the space, and they're like 20 bucks each. It's a trivial, small, simple thing.